Cross Question with Ian Dale. Hello, very good evening. Eight o'clock is the time on LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's Wednesday's Cross Question. We have a great panel for you tonight. Michael Crick is here. I introduced him earlier as legendary political journalist. He is exactly that. If you followed his career, you'll know why. He's also the author of a new biography of Nigel Farage. We'll get a little bit of an insight into that in a moment. Or you can actually listen to him talk to me for about an hour about it on my book club podcast if you really want to. It was too. It was. Um, Alicia Kearns is here, Conservative MP for Rutland and Melton. He's a member of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee and the National St- Security Strategy Committee. Um, Afua Hagen will be joining us shortly. She's just stuck in traffic, but she will be here in a couple of minutes' time. And Christine Jardine is Liberal Democrat MP for Edinburgh West and the party's Treasury spokesperson. Lots to talk about tonight. Uh, phone in on any subject you like, not just Ukraine. We will have a lot of questions on Ukraine. Completely get that. But let's try and do a couple of others in the second half of the programme as well. 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. And of course, you can watch us on Global Player. Let's go to our first question. It's from Chris in Richmond. Hello, Chris. Uh, good evening, panel. Good evening, Ian. Um, my question is this. Uh, should Pretty Patel be resigning as Home Secretary, having misled the House of Commons yesterday over the status of visa processing centres for Ukrainian refugees? So what did she say exactly as to the reason why you think she should resign? Well, because she claimed, claimed that these, these centres were up and running, when actually they weren't even operational. And she was called on it by, out on it by Roger Gale, so Roger Gale and also by Vote Keeper. And then she sort of backed Christine later Jard- on. OK, Christine Jardine. Um, Pretty Patel's time in the Home Office has been a litany of mistakes, gaffes and, to my mind, neglect of the, the issue of um, immigrants in this country. Um, I don't think she's handled any of it particularly well and I think at the moment we are at a, a point in our history where we really need to be on top of the refugee crisis and bringing people to this country making sure it's possible for people who leave Ukraine to feel that they are welcome in this country and we enable them to come here as safely as possible and children can come here and sleep safely in their beds and I do feel that the government has been too slow that what they are trying to do is too cumbersome um, and to expect people who are running, r- fleeing war with what they can carry, leaving everything they know, everything they love, everything they own and then expect them to go through a complicated visa system in a, in a place which hasn't yet been determined or at least has been determined but there's nobody there is just not acceptable. And I do think that the government has to examine what they've done so far and change it and really get to grips with the problem, which the public, I think, I mean, I I think it's an excellent question. And, you know, I I don't know what you think about this, but I hear from my constituents every time I speak to them that they really want to welcome um, refugees to this country from Ukraine. They want to stand by Ukraine. They want to do everything they possibly can to help. And they feel that the government is letting them down and letting them down specifically on refugees. Let me put a scenario to you, because I think you used to be a Home Affairs spokesperson. I was, yes. Lived down, didn't you? Well, imagine you're sitting in Priti Patel's office. You mm-hmm. are the Home Secretary mm-hmm. in a coalition government. Won't mm-hmm. say which colour, but uh, <laughs> you are the Home Secretary. Okay. And you get a report from MI6 that says that Russian security services are about to infiltrate Ukrainian refugees coming to this country. Mm-hmm. You can't just dismiss that, can you? You have to take it into account. And I'm assuming that that's what's happened. I can't think she's sort of made up these security concerns. They, they would have had to have been some intelligence that that was a distinct possibility i think i would i think i would look at it from a different perspective i wouldn't assume that everybody coming to this country was uh, a russian spy trying to infiltrate our system i would assume that everybody coming to this country was a refugee and that amongst them there might be one and or therefore two. you're putting the country's then, security into jeopardy no 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 because we would still i would still look for them but i would do it once we had made sure that they were safe and then you check there's nothing to stop you checking people when they come to this country too late or when you get to a Too point late. but what we have done here. what we have done so far is failed to um protect 
the people who are fleeing the war in Ukraine. And there is no way that the government can dress it up, that the public will accept that they have not failed to get the, the children. You don't get many children, frankly, who are terrorists. You don't get many children who have family in this country who want to come and join them, who are a threat to security. I had a woman come into my office about 10 days ago who um, is married to a British citizen. She escaped Ukraine on, and she came here on a, a visitor's visa and she was trying to apply for a spousal visa. And all the time she was being given contradictory advice by the, the Home Office. Now, mm. That's not just you know talking about security. That's being incompetent yeah, and absolutely. not giving people okay. the right advice. That's the problem. Alyssa Kearns, there are a lot of Conservative MPs, <coughs> excuse me, who are unhappy with Priti Patel and the way the Home Office has handled this. Given what she said in the Commons yesterday, which was not correct, Chris thinks she should resign. Do you? So I didn't actually see what Priti said uh, in the chamber yesterday. Uh, so I apologise for not being able to comment specifically on that. But I, I am one of those MPs that has been saying we should go faster. Uh, we need to get people to safety. Uh, these are women and children who, out of no mistake of their own, not out of their own wishes, are having to flee yeah. their own country. Um, we have children sleeping in bunkers, not knowing if they're yep. going to see their parents again. Um, and ultimately, we can get people here much faster. And there seems to be some kind of administrative process system but no we clearly weren't ready in time um uh, but the difficulty is we should be doing security checks but we've proved through afghanistan that we can do those at absolute speed and get yeah. people out um so i would love to see us for example rewashing biometric data at the moment we're requiring people to get new biometric data if they've been here in the last 10 yeah. years just rewash the old biometric data um so i have so i am one of those people who thinks we could go harder and faster because this is a country who we promise to defend and to protect mm -hmm. And what reaction, when you put those points to Home Office Ministers, and I mean, the great advantage of our um, voting system in the Commons is that, I mean, tonight, I don't know what, if, what the votes are tonight, but if, if there's a vote at 10 o'clock, mm -hmm. you can sidle up to Priti Patel and have a little word in her ear. Are you getting the impression that she, the Immigration Minister Kevin Foster, actually understand that the general public are absolutely fed up with their policy on this? So I think they're definitely listening. Um, I think it also sits across Michael Gove's department. He's very much on an engaged footing and wanting to speak to MPs to work out what the right system should be for this uh, sponsorship scheme they're planning to put in place. Um, but I, I keep being told we're listening and more is coming. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, that is exactly the case. And if we're here this time next week and very little has changed, I mean, that's going to be a serious political issue for the government, which a lot of people are saying, well, they've performed quite well on the, the whole crisis so far. But as who was it said to Tim Lawton sitting here earlier on said mm. to me, they're grabbing defeat from the jaws of victory on this politically. Uh, Tim has a very good way with words, and I, I can't say I disagree. Feel free with him. to trump him. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I wish I could. That's not. I am definitely not a word master. I wish I was, um, but no, I, I agree with him on that. And I think uh, I, you would. I found the last few days very difficult, and I think uh, that would be continue to be the case. Michael Crick. Well, the Home Office has an appalling record yeah. at running virtually mm. anything, yeah. particularly when it comes to immigration. I remember. You know, way back in 1986, <laughs> as a Channel 4 News young reporter, suggesting we do a report on why is the Home Office so incompetent. And 35, 36 years later, <laughs> the same question. I was only going to go back to 2006 <laughs> when John Reid said it wasn't fit for purpose, but you, you've trumped me on that one. <laughs> and, well, well, I'm laughing, it shouldn't really, it's, it's, it's incredibly serious. And, of course, we saw the Windrush affair yeah. when they were utterly hopeless um and i mean i can understand the concerns because if several months from now you know somebody some uh terrorists have come in as refugees and commit some appalling atrocity with novichok i mean you know something worse than we've ever known before then everybody's going to be saying why didn't you why didn't you do proper checks but i do think on balance that the government is not being fast enough is not being generous enough i see the spectators tonight in their mm -hmm. this week's cover mm -hmm. Uh, I've got a, a big, uh, you know, the headline is border farce and they've yeah. got a cartoon showing other European countries, other European states yeah. oh, putting up welcome signs and Britain puts yeah. up a, 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 you know, a, a long, long form uh, to fill in. As for whether Priti Patel should resign, um, I don't know the details of whether she misled the House yesterday. And frankly, I don't think Priti Patel should be a government minister after 
what she did uh, mm. when she was at international development and started negotiating with the Israelis without telling uh, the Foreign Office or Downing Street. But I don't think she should have ever been allowed back into government. I think she's uh, a dreadful minister. Uh, but I don't think now is the time to be getting rid of ministers and to be having government reshuffles. And so therefore, uh, when it comes to Chris's specific question, my answer is no, she shouldn't resign. Afra Hagen has got through the traffic, Hello. Afra. Well done. Welcome. <laughs> um, let me just tell you what the question is that we're, we're discussing. Chris in Richmond has phoned in to ask, should Priti Patel resign after misleading the House over refugees? What's your view? I think I have to agree that Priti Patel probably should have resigned a long time ago. <laughs> yes. um, I think in, in this specific case, now is not the time to take the heads off the snakes. At this point, um, we're in crisis mode, and I think you know, for now, to uh, for us to be removing ministers and reshuffling, it takes the focus on what the issues really are. And the issue at the moment is refugees, is admitting mm -hmm. refugees as quickly, as efficiently as we possibly can. I think in the future, we certainly need to get rid of Pretty Patel, like I said. And like you said, that should have been done years ago. She should never have made a return to government. But I think that would, if we get rid of her now, it takes the focus off the refugees. Yeah. And what we need to be doing is figuring out really simple, easy and quick ways that we can help people resettle. People who have travelled hundreds of thousands of miles yeah. to get here. Not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds and thousands of miles to get here. Let's get them in the country. Let's get them settled. Let's stop saying that we are, you know, the leader in the world of resettling refugees. I mean, frankly, we are We're not. And let's try and be that leader. Let's try and do that. Let's get rid of miles and miles of red tape. On the programme tonight, in the last hour, we had... I think five different suggestions as from uh, Tim Lawton actually made three and then we had a couple of callers who made some really interesting suggestions as to ways that the bureaucracy could be cut through. Um, is the Home Office, um, Alicia, I I capable of taking on these kind? I mean, they're the sort of suggestions you you'd imagine that civil servants would have already come up with, but they clearly haven't been acted on. I think there is a fundamental problem within the civil service where often ideas just don't get up the system. And I saw that when I was a civil servant. Um, mm -hmm. And that is incredibly frustrating. And I found the civil service so often, the focus wasn't on what would meaningfully make a difference to people's lives, but what ticked all the boxes. Oh, well, something's had agreement from five different departments and all the legal teams, and therefore we're going ahead with it but it doesn't help people. Yes, but it's got the agreement and everyone's come round and uh, it is an incredibly frustrating. Like, and the Home Office seems to have this litany. It doesn't seem to matter who's in power, where there seem to continually be problems in the Home Office time and time again. And I found it quite a belligerent department to deal with when I worked at Justice. Um, so there is clearly something institutionally wrong there. I just, I can't put my finger on it. I don't think that's... A, on, sorry to, to argue. I don't think it's good, it's good enough for you don't mind me saying to, to blame... The civil servants. Why not? Why is it that civil think, servants always get a free pass? No, I'm not saying they should get a free pass, but I'm saying the whole point of the government is that they should take the lead and they should do something about it. If they acknowledge that there's maybe a problem there... But then politicians are generally acting it. on advice from civil servants, aren't they? But they take responsibility for the Absolutely. Decisions. And they should unfair. be doing I haven't them. blamed civil servants. No, but I, I just think it's very... Should, no, no, no. I've said the government should go further. Okay. I've been critical no, of the government throughout that. this. But I am also saying that civil service is a problem because I have worked in it. Yeah. So I am very legitimate. And I accept that. Problems. And I was a special advisor as well. And I know well, the, the difficulties of, you know, civil servants having priorities. I didn't know that. Did you not know no. that? I was what department a, were you in? Um, oh, dear. I worked, <laughs> <laughs> I worked in Downing Street for Nick Clegg in the early part of the, the coalition. And I, I know the issues that are there and the tensions. However... It's up to the government to overcome those. And what we have seen, yes, there will be an element of, as you say, ideas being lost in the civil service and it doesn't, doesn't tick boxes, but we are in a crisis. We're in an emergency. And what the country expects is for the government to behave as if it's in an emergency and to react quickly, to act strongly and to do something about refugees and welcoming them to this country. And it's not good enough okay. to keep saying, well, you know, it's somebody else's fault. They have to take responsibility and do it. Michael Crick, just on this point of civil servants, I mean, you've already said, look, you, you've been around a bit in government, you know how it all works. Well, what, I've what, worked in government. No, you haven't worked <laughs> in government, but you've observed it. What, why is it that there is this convention that civil servants are beyond reproach and beyond criticism? 
I, I think because there's also a convention that ministers are ultimately responsible, but there are some civil servants at the very top who will have spent 10, 20 years within the same government department. Mm. But, you know, I always think it's a, it may not, it, it's a sort of institutional thing. Mm. Um, uh, and th there is something in the Home Office. I mean, they split the Home Office uh, some years True ago, between justice, just yeah. 20 years ago or so, between justice and the Home Office, and it's still not made a difference. Um, I, I, it's, it's almost as if they need to scrap the whole thing and start yeah. again. I well, totally um, agree. I mean, of course, the other thing, <laughs> to be fair to them, they are actually being asked to almost reverse policy here. You know, until two weeks mm. ago, yeah. all the pressure was on yeah. Pretty to Patel to do something about the cross-channel refugees and now she's being asked to go in the opposite direction there is one thing that the home office used to do really well run elections and then of course tony blair came in and took that out of the home office and <laughs> made the electoral commission that. i'm not going to get started on the electoral commission otherwise i'd be here all night um chris in richmond um, i i think you think pretty patel should go don't you well i do i think i mean you know amber amber rudd and us all for a similar offense i think two other points number one if the government's concerned about security issues can we just revisit the issue of a certain peer in the House of Lords where supposedly yes. the Prime Minister may have intervened in that decision despite the advice of security services? And secondly, we should have seen this coming like a 10 ton truck that the refugee crisis was going to happen. Well, it's, in, it's that, interesting that you mention Amber Rudd there because, of course, it was subsequently proved that she shouldn't have resigned and yeah. she had no need to resign and yeah. because she, she was given duff advice and she repeated it the advice that she was given at the dispatch box and you could argue if you were being kind to Pretty Patel that that's maybe what's happened here I don't know but you could argue that Chris thank you very much 0345 6060 973 we'll take more of your questions in just a moment you're listening to Cross Question on LBC with me Ian Dale it's 17 minutes past 8 this is LBC it's
Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 20 minutes past eight. With me in the studio, Christine Jardine, Liberal Democrat MP for Edinburgh West, third party Treasury spokesperson. Afua Hagen, broadcaster and journalist. Alicia Kearns, Conservative MP for Rutland and Melton. And Michael Crick, political journalist and biographer. And now your book on Nigel Farage called One Party After Another. I'm halfway through it at the moment, really, really enjoying it. I'm not just saying that. I hope our other three panellists might buy it if they haven't done already. Because it, you've written it in a way that it doesn't matter whether you like Nigel Farage or you don't like Nigel Farage. It's just a fascinating story. It must have been such fun to write. Yeah, and I always knew it was going to be a great story. And indeed, when Farage first emerged and he was, you know, that UKIP started doing well in those by-elections, 2012, 2013, and I would always be interviewing Farage, I thought, this guy is, is worth a book. And I thought, well, somebody else is bound to do it. And one or two other people tried, yeah. and they couldn't get publishers and things like that. And eventually, I thought, right, I'm going to do it. And I knew it was going to be... Uh, a fun book to research and and to write. There's no boring bits. There's no sort of five years when he doesn't really do anything, <laughs> like, like, there often, like there often is with people in politics. And um, could we say that about Christine? I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> That's cruel. And so it was a bit like I wrote a book about Geoffrey Archer. He was he was he was just the same. Um, and I mean, the one drawback was is was the because a lot of the research was done during COVID. Yeah. I had to do a lot of interviews on, online and, and I you know, I couldn't go and see as many people as I would have and, done normally. And did your opinion of him change after you finished the book? Broadly speaking, no. Although I was left feeling he's a much more ruthless and, you know, he can be pretty nasty in purging people. With he's a good unit. purger, isn't he? You know, yeah. he, 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 he had the same pattern again and again. He would bring somebody into UKIP, encourage them, say, yeah, we'll get you into the European Parliament, which, of course, he was a total dictator, so he would decide who was in the European Parliament. And then uh, he'd realise these people were making good progress and they were a bit of a threat, and then they would be <laughs> eased out. And, uh, and, and in a way, that caused UKIP huge problems when he resigned, because there was no obvious succession or when he, on the many occasions when he was <laughs> uh, and as a result you kept dwindled down to nothing well if you want to hear more from Michael talking about his book you can do so on my book club podcast um, right Kate in Liverpool sent in a text question um, do you think the public would support a complete waiving of visa requirements for Ukrainians we've sort of touched on this in the last uh, question so brief answers if we can Afwa no they wouldn't really no definitely not do you not think that there's a change of mood uh, on this issue that because people see on their television screens every day what's happening, that even those who might be quite anti-immigration, would their hearts would soften on this? No. <laughs> no, because the great British public don't forget. And there's a certain swathe of society who are still have that rhetoric of coming to take our jobs and coming to take our homes. The, they will never blanketly support waiving of visas or waiving anything for anybody. But don't you think that's a small minority? I think it's a small minority, but it's enough to make a loud enough voice. And sometimes, you know, that small minority can be very, very loud. And do you think so that's driving government policy at the moment? I don't think it's driving government policy. I think what is driving government policy is like you guys have so rightly pointed out that the civil service are slow and slow to react, don't seem to be able to get on top of the fact that we're in a crisis and need to go into crisis mode. I think we're just slow as a country. Um, our government is slow, our processes are slow. There's still too much red red tape everywhere. But I absolutely do not think that the British public would support waiving visas. Christine. Not unanimously, no. I don't agree. I think they would. I, when I'm out talking to people in Edinburgh West or anywhere else for that matter, but mainly Edinburgh West, what I'm getting from people is that they are heartbroken at what they see on the television every night from Ukraine. They want to do more. They don't feel we're doing enough. And then they hear that we're we're having visa restrictions on refugees. And that goes against everything that we believe this country is about. And the people in this country genuinely believe in our tradition of welcoming people, the, the more than 25,000 we welcomed from Uganda escaping from Idi Amin, 25,000 Syrians escaping. Um, I think it was 15, something like 15,000 Afghan refugees at the start of the century. And you go right back to the Huguenots, right through our history, we have welcomed refugees with open arms. The word refugee comes from the refuge in London where the Huguenots went 
where they were welcomed. The word refugee began in this country. And we, I think the people of this country are very proud of that tradition. And they believe strongly that we should be doing everything we possibly can to help the ordinary people in Ukraine who have been forced to leave lives like ours. European, European city, a metropolitan city, comfortable lives, and suddenly they're being forced to flee with nothing. And the fact that we've been so slow, we're so far behind countries like Poland, who have taken thousands of people, Ireland, I think that actually goes against the grain for the majority of people in this country and they're disappointed in the government. Well, it's not every LBC programme that you get the Huguenots brought into the conversation. <laughs> so thank, thank you for that. Alicia? Um, I think it's really quite a complicated one because I think in people's hearts, they want to give people asylum, they want to give people refuge, and they want people taken to safety. But in their hearts, we should recognise the fear people genuinely have at the moment in terms of the energy crisis, the way that's going to impact, what's going to happen to them. And a lot of the emails I'm getting from people are, please, please, please bring people to this country. But also, can you please reassure me, I'm so scared, I'm so nervous. So I think we should be bringing in far, far more people we shouldn't waive the security checks, but we know they can be done at speed, as we mm -hmm. saw in Afghanistan. Um, so I think people would support an emergency two-year refugee visa of some sort, where essentially you don't apply for a visa and have to go through lots of checks except the security one. I think that people would absolutely support. But people, their hearts are absolutely open, but they're also quite scared at the moment in terms of the cost going forward. But overwhelmingly, their compassion wins out. Should Surely well, it's up to us, though, to reassure them, to find a way of protecting them. That's our job. Well, is to I agree, but I'm not going to. Okay. I'm not going to pretend that that's not how people feel. No, yeah, that is how people. And, feel. and I think the the difference here also is that. People who come here from Ukraine are not necessarily going to, as you put it, Africa to come and sort of stay and steal our jobs and all the rest of it. Mm. Because hopefully, when this is all over, they will want to rebuild their country. And I, I, I absolutely believe, given the characteristics yes. that we've seen Ukrainians display so far, I absolutely think that the majority would, would want to do that. Michael? Yes, but the, this war may go on or at least hostilities in Ukraine. I mean, you know, it's possible the Russians will win and install a puppet government, but there is uh, a guerrilla army and, and it's, it remains uh, in conflict for mm. years and years and years. And I think that... Just, just cheer us up, uh, why yeah, don't Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> at the moment, I think that the you know, a majority in this country would, would welcome them without, uh, with, without visas. But that could change uh, if, it, if, if they're here for a long time. If they're concentrated in certain areas of the country, and I think that the, the government sh should, you know, try and spread them out and, and uh, make use of the generosity of people throughout mm. the country. Mm. Uh, and of course, you, there's the numbers. Um, I mean, if we're talking about sort of ten, twenty thousand at the moment, but you know, you could be talking about two hundred thousand. And so it is. It is, I can understand the government's concerns. It is a difficult issue, and and where is everybody going to be housed and so on. But uh, well, I, think, I, think the, the... I think in terms of the specific question that Kate asked, I think that the, the, the public would mm. uh, accept that. In terms of this sponsorship scheme, which we don't know the details of yet, um, this is really to the two MPs more than um, anybody, I guess. Is it important that it is very simple? Because mm. there, there is a Syrian sponsorship scheme which i don't think has worked it mm -hmm. takes so long you, you have to form community trusts and it sort of gets very bureaucratic what we want is the situation that we saw at berlin train station where somebody's holding up a placard saying right i can take a family of four yeah. come with me now you'll get all sorts of people who mean well and say oh yes but we've got to have criminal records checks and all the rest of it mm -hmm. sorry that that is irrelevant to this situation i yeah. think what, what do you think christine I, I think it has to be as simple as possible i think um I hate um, comparisons with the, the Second World War generally, but I think if you look back at the Second World War, we didn't sit on our, our hands in the way that we have in this. and We should be welcoming people. I think we should be doing things like seizing the, the mansions of the, the oligarchs all over the country and using them to house Ukrainian well, refugees. Chelsea Football Club. Yeah. Uh, but no. And I, and I, no, seriously, and I think that in this situation, you mentioned the fact that most Ukrainian refugees will want to go home. I've thought about it from my point of view. There will be people like me who are fleeing with their families from Ukraine tonight. Now, if that was me and I was forced to flee from this country, I would want to come back. I would be so grateful for the country that yeah. helped us. But in the long run, I would want to come home and rebuild my country. And I think that's what we're seeing from the Ukrainians. And I think that's what people in this country recognise. It gets difficult, though, if 
uh, people come here and they're here, say, for 10 years. Yes. And their children are educated here and learn English. And you may get a... You, you will have divided families then. Maybe parents want to mm. go back and the children find it a real a real wrench. But we'll, we have to, you know, get, get used to that idea and, and, and accommodate that. We, we can accommodate uh, those kind of numbers over time. And we have to accept, actually, that there is people who have seen some terrible mm -hmm. things and won't want to go back and will want to settle here. You mm -hmm. know, that, that will just decide that, no, you know, what I saw was too much. I've left that country. I'm, I'm, I've am I'm. settled in the UK now. <coughs> and, you know, we could really be in for a protracted war. Let's remember that Ukraine actually has been at war since 2014, 2015, yes. yeah. when Crimea was an annexed. You know, they still have had that guerrilla mm -hmm. war that's been going on since then. You know, what is that? Uh, some instant maths, eight years or something now. Yeah. So we could be in for a protracted we, 10, 20 years. We could well war. be. And, and to that point and to Michael's point, we have an employment gap in this country at the moment. Yeah. Um, in Scotland in particular, we have an employment gap. We need people with skills to come to this country. And if people come here as refugees and they do want to stay, they do bring something to the economy, they bring their skills, they are a benefit to this country, they work here, they pay tax and national insurance. We then benefit as a country. We mm. have benefited from generations of, of immigrants to this country. My family came here from Ireland 200 years ago, whenever the devil it was. We've benefited from that. Mm -hmm. And I think we should remember that. Our priority should be helping those people fleeing. And I think, you know, the British people want to do that. But we should also remember that they can bring a benefit as well. well there there was a wonderful film on Newsnight last night that Lewis Goodall did. He's actually in Poland. That, yes. And he visited a Polish family who've taken in a Ukrainian family. Mm -hmm. And he interviewed both, both families families and what it meant to them it was really touching and I was thinking that's that should be happening all over this country mm -hmm. at the moment but mm -hmm. uh, hopefully it will very soon right we'll take more of your calls in a moment 0345 6060 973 but first the news headlines at 832 on LBC with Lottie Morley David Cameron has told LBC an attack on a maternity hospital in Ukraine is absolutely horrific. Children are thought to be buried under the rubble following an airstrike in Mariupol. The former Prime Minister has defended the UK's policy on Russia. Speaking on tonight with Andrew Marr, he says Britain was never naive about President Putin's objectives. Ukrainian ministers say Russia must allow for repairs to take place on the Chernobyl nuclear plant. Power supplies have been cut, sparking fears they could be erased radiation leak. LBC weather, rain easing tonight, cloudy for most, staying clear in the northwest and parts of the southeast, a low of minus two. This is LBC.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. It's 8.36. <laughs> with us on the panel tonight, Michael Crick, Alicia Cairns, Afra Hagen and Christine Jardine. Afra, since the last time I saw you, you got married. I did. Yeah. Oh, yes, I did. Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks very much. <laughs> I wasn't so expecting happy. that there. <laughs> no, I know you were, but it's I thought, just... well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enough of that. Let's go on to the next question. <laughs> uh, it is from Harry in Waltham Forest. Hello, Harry. Good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. Evening. Hi, um, what would you like to say? Does the team think that given that Putin and the Russian military seem intent on causing an accidentally on purpose nuclear radiation leak? that we should have by now instituted an no-fly zone. Michael. Mm. Well, I mean, what's going on with uh, Chernobyl and the other nuclear power stations and so on is exceedingly worrying. But uh, my feeling is, no, we should not impose a no-fly zone. Um, I mean, this is... The trouble is, since 1945, we have lived under the threat of nuclear war and we've gone for what 77 years i mean astonishingly really that nobody has has let off a nuclear weapon in anger in all of that time who would have thought that in 1945 and the trouble is the danger is that a no-fly zone will end up um would end inevitably bring nato planes up against russian planes or uh, 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 it would bring america up against russia and goodness knows the consequences of that. I hate saying this. I do feel I want I want us to be able to do something, uh, but the the people who are more expert than me at the moment seem to in defence and in intelligence seem to think it would be a, a a bad idea. The same experts who told us that Putin wouldn't invade. You mean? I know, I know. But uh, I mean, the trouble is, is this man mad? I mean, does this man behave rationally? And I'm not sure he does. You know, uh, he's, he, he, the danger is, does this man have the mindset of the, you know, the absolutely the, uh, madmen who go into American schools with guns and kill mm. 10 kids and then kill themselves? Um, and uh, so it is so delicate, this situation. And I just, I'm, I, I'm afraid we can't impose a no-fly zone, much though I wish we could. Mm. Alicia. So I think we actually have to be quite careful because the UK and US intelligence services have been saying since the start of January that there was going to be an invasion. They have been very clear on this. The Germans said, no, it's not going to happen. A lot of the Europeans said they weren't going to happen. But when I was in Kiev uh, in mid-January, they were very clear and they said it's going to happen in four weeks. It happened in six weeks. That's really interesting because everyone I interviewed in Ukraine in the run-up to it said, no, 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 it's not going to happen. I didn't. I'm not sure I believed them. I wasn't sure he was going to do it because he'd, he'd achieved so much in the months leading up to it. Mm. He divided the West, he'd be able to force them to come to him in Russia, he'd be able to identify fault lines. Um, we'd essentially move to a point where we were saying, well, just don't go further. You can have the bits you're already illegally occupying, just don't go further. But the intelligence services were saying he would in the UK and US, and they were right. They also told me that the biggest issue they foresaw was that Putin thought his military was far more capable and could move far quicker than what they actually yeah. could. Again, 100% completely correct in terms of their assessment. Putin and these false flags and him causing a nuclear accident, this is his game. This is what he does. And the UK has been foremost at exposing the realities of what he's doing. It is our job as the West, should there be some sort of nuclear accident, and I, God, I hope that doesn't happen, it is for us to be moderate and to work out what really happened and who was behind it and to monitor it and control things. And in terms of no-fly zone... Do I wish we had done something preventively? Yes, but have we? had we done that, it might not have been deterrent. It might have made things worse. It might have accelerated things. But in terms of no-fly zone, I'm not sat here with the intelligence in front of me to be able to understand Putin's state of mind. And a state of mind assessment is a, is a formal intelligence assessment that's done of, of a target or, or an individual. Um, so I cannot sit here and say we should do a no-fly zone because I do not have the intelligence. And what we're hearing from NATO countries is that it is not safe to do one. And that if we do so, it will escalate and we will end up sending British men and women to be shot out of the sky in Ukraine and we will have to put our people in military. And if we are prepared to do that, then fine. But I don't think we are. Um, I've got to come to Michael's defence here because somebody says, please remind your expert of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What an expert to have saying no one let off a nuclear bomb. Well, Michael actually said since 1945. Um, So you've got the wrong end of the stick there. On the other hand, somebody said, uh, Annette says, I'm quite impressed by Michael Crick Mm -hmm. tonight. I never used to see him harassing MPs. (laughs) (laughs) Afra. 
It's a difficult one, isn't it? Because if we imp- if we decide that we're going to impose a no-fly zone, like Alicia said, then that's going to take our troops, our men and our women to shoot down Russian planes. And it is going to escalate. And what we don't want is it feels like we're in a very delicate situation where we're at a knife edge point at the moment. Um, you know, we can see that Putin doesn't really seem to care about the people on the ground. Hospitals being bombed, maternity units, children's hospitals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that's our latest piles of rubble with children underneath them. He's not really bothered about the targets. You know, you're establish, you, establishing humanitarian corridors, then firing on said corridors. So, I, I mean, I know that you said, you know, that, that they would do a state of mind report. But I think we can take from that that, you know, he's slightly volatile at the moment. Chernobyl is under threat. You know, the energy around that has shut down. Reactors are cooling. They haven't had a shift change in in such a long time. That's our latest threat. And if he carries on the way that he's going and something is allowed to happen to Chernobyl that releases nuclear energy or he continues using weapons. You know, the UK say that they have um, evidence that he's using unconventional types of weapons. Nuclear weapons could be where we're going. A chemical, chemical bombs, chemical weapons over Kiev. And I think if we antagonize him, you don't want to poke a sleeping dragon in the eye or an awake dragon in the eye in this case. If we impose a no-fly zone and that... Um, ends up with us shooting down Russian planes, then I think we've become fully engaged. And I think Putin is very ready to bring the full might of Russia to us. And I don't necessarily mean to us, you know, and the UK as an island, but to anybody that engages him. And so, but in the same vein, we do want to stop the bombing of hospitals. We do want to try and protect nuclear targets. So what do we do? I know I haven't answered your question, but it seems that we're stuck between... No, but I think, I think you've reflected the questions that the whole country's asking itself at the moment. Christine? I think that's true. We are all saying, what can we do? What can we do? Well, we should have had more sanctions. We should have had them more quickly. We should. They should be more far-reaching. We should have... We should well, have a list. They've been quite of quick, and they are far more they're, they're far-reaching not, than anyone they're thought. They're not as far-reaching. I mean, the, the list of people who have been sanctioned by Europe and America is, you know, has hundreds of people on it. And we've got, you know, tens of people on it. It should be but thousands. But of yes, people. it should actually, and we should, we should, we should be being much stronger than we actually are. Um, but I agree with what you say about, you know, don't poke the dragon. But also, I think we are being we are in danger of being pulled into it. It is what he would like. If you impose a no-fly zone, NATO has to NATO has to impose it, NATO has to enforce it, and then NATO has to react when Putin, as he will, sends an aircraft up to be shot down in order to antagonise NATO and to cause a war. And then we have to accept that that will, excel, that will escalate into possibly millions of deaths. Um, and I may sound pessimistic, but I was born in the 1960s. I grew Me up too. in the Cold War. And I think partly... Early or late? Mm, I'm not that. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't possibly comment. That's not a question to ask. Obviously you. late, I, I, thought would, you were a I would say. Oh, thank you very much. You're too kind. But I, I, think part of the, there, yeah, I? I think part of the issue with this is that those of us who were born in the 60s and grew up in the Cold War lived with this fear, yeah. lived with the... The sort of acknowledgement that if there were a conflict, it would be huge yeah. and it would potentially destroy us all. And we had, you know, public information films at school about hiding under desks when I think about it, it's ridiculous and closing windows and curtains. And we've kind of lost that awareness since, you know, we, we thought the Russians became our friends in 1990. And we, we are now realising that that was a kind of false reality. And we're now back to where we were without the kind of appreciation and understanding and acknowledgement of what a war with Russia would actually mean. Mm. And it would be horrific and it would be on a scale that we've never seen in this in the world before. It would be World War Three. And that is not, I don't think, in anybody's interests 
at the moment. It certainly wouldn't help okay. the people in Ukraine to make the war worse. Harry, thank you for your question. Unusually, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to think about the answer to the next question from Sean in Cardiff, who says Cardiff Philharmonic Orchestra have removed the Russian composer Tchaikovsky from its forthcoming programme due to the conflict in Ukraine. Isn't that going a bit far? Well, stand by your beds. We'll get the answers to that in just a moment. It's 846 Tonight, with Andrew Marr, only on LBC. The wife of a former Putin minister paid quite a lot of money to play tennis with you and with Boris Johnson. Did you play tennis I, with I, I do, I remember. There was absolutely no conversation about Russia or about finance, about Putin or anything else. Let me make... So what first do you think they were on, trying on, to buy? We had a very careful system vetting who could and who could not yeah. give money to the Conservative Party. It's a giant red herring to well, suggest I'm... in some way that Russian money somehow influenced cons- the policy against okay, Putin and Russia. So what did they think they were buying? Tonight, with Andrew Marr, returns tomorrow from 6pm. Listen on your radio and on Global Player. LBC. question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 10 to 9, Michael Crick, Alicia Cairns, Afra Hagen and Christine Jardine uh, with us answering your questions. So, Sean in Cardiff wants to know, Cardiff Philharmonic Orchestra have removed the Russian composer Tchaikovsky from its forthcoming programme due to the conflict in Ukraine. Isn't that going a bit far, Alicia Kearns? It absolutely is. This is not a war with the Russian people. It is not a war with their culture. It is not a war with their society. It is the absolute opposite. We are trying to send a message to the Russian people here that our war is not against them. It is against somebody who is misappropriating their interests and has misappropriated their wealth and health for too long. Uh, we should be, if anything, playing Tchaikovsky to show solidarity with the people of Russia and that they are not our enemies. That's true. 
I couldn't agree with you more, actually, Alicia. And also, it sort of takes the focus on off the real issues here. I mean, Chai. Tchaikovsky literally has nothing to do with what's happening mm. right now, yeah. and not but everybody. Then, nor in does Russia's a Russian footballer, do they? I mean, you could, you could, if you wanted to take that argument to its logical extent, you could say, well, why, why are we punishing sport, individual sports people? That's that is true, but we know how Putin feels about sport and how much he uses that for propaganda. So that's a way of getting to Putin. Um, I think by banning someone who's historically so well regarded in Russia and actually across the world sends the wrong message. And like we said, we should be showing solidarity with with the Russian people who actually don't support this war. Mm -hmm. Christine? Yeah. Oh, you're going to get solidarity here tonight. I That's why I asked the I short answers. <laughs> I can't see any point whatsoever in, in banning Tchaikovsky. What would make more sense to me would be to rename the street on which the Russian embassy stands in London to uh, name it after Zelensky, the name in which the, the street in which the Russian consulate stands in Edinburgh. I come from Glasgow. I know the impact it had when uh, we renamed the street after Nelson Mandela and mm. it was the street in which the South African embassy stood and they had to put on all their letterheads, Republic, um, um, Consulate of the Republic of South Africa, one Nelson Mandela <laughs> place. It was wonderful. And there are gestures that you can make oh, no, to make the point. That's a very good idea. And Tchaikovsky, I just don't get because he's not someone who can influence um, Putin. And like Elisa says, we should be sending a message of solidarity to the Russian people who are suffering. Michael? Two points. First, we have to, uh, when this is all over, and it could be decades, we have to establish good relations with Russia again. And we have to mm -hmm. make it clear that our dispute is not with the Russian people or Russia, Russian culture. The point you made about football clubs is that's a bit different. Russian football clubs are part mm -hmm. of this regime. Yes. Their foot, the, you know, they obtained the 2018 World Cup corruptly. Uh, all their sports teams at the Olympics uh, uh, are engaged, not all of them, but a lot of them seem to be engaged in uh, 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 drug misuse and all of those things. Uh, and that's why they need to be banned, because they're all part of this hugely corrupt system, autocratic system. Tchaikovsky and, and Tolstoy and everything are all part of this great Russian cultural past that we need to revere and we need to uh, use our respect for Russia and its past in that sense as a way of re-establishing good relations in the long term yeah. with hopefully a democratic and benign regime, although Russia has never in the past shown much inclination to have, to embrace democracy. It's been democratic for about six weeks, I think. Because, of course, the logical... If, if that yeah. has indeed happened, the logical next step is to burn Russian books, isn't it? Yeah. Which, I mean, none, so, nobody yes. surely would think that was no. a good idea. Yeah. Howard in Erklan uh, Dudno says, I'm a fan of the music of the Russian composer Shostakovich. I have a complete mm -hmm. edition of his works on CD. Shostakovich got into trouble with the communists at least twice because he was a man of the people. Deleting the works of Russian composers from concert programmes is ridiculous. What about Stravinsky, Rachmaninoff, mm -hmm. et al., who left Russia because of the authorities? Well, absolutely bang on. Uh, Sean, good question. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth in Sheffield asks, is the government doing enough to tackle the cost of living? Um, well, we've only got five minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> Michael? No. Um, and the cost of living is going to get a lot worse now uh, with the with the Ukrainian war. Uh, I mean, I can see inflation getting in, easily getting into double figures, and the Chancellor has come up with some measures, but uh, and I think it should be left to the Chancellor uh, and uh, to, uh, and the Treasury to try and sort this out. <clears throat> and I think Labour today at Prime Minister's questions with Keir Starmer using uh, using all six questions on this issue got it wrong. Uh, it's, it should not be Boris Johnson's main concern right now. Boris Johnson should be spending 95% of his time on Ukraine. But this cost of living crisis is, is a, a massive problem for the government and other members of the government, the Treasury and, and Rishi Sunak, have got to deal with it. Well, three of us around this table can remember the inflation of the 1970s, mm -hmm. but to me... This seems worse than that. When you look at, I mean, Tom Swarbrick, my colleague who's on at 10, he just sent me a picture of a, a petrol station on the A20 where diesel is now 199.9. Now, it's interesting. It's a different kind of inflation, isn't it? Because in those days, we thought, well, all you, if you bring in an incomes policy and a prices policy, you can contain it yeah. for a few weeks. 
you can't you can't possibly do that anymore uh. um and quite how you contain it and and, and really that what what people are arguing for is more and more government subsidies yeah well the, go- the government can't carry on subsidizing our energy bills forever mm. after all no, the government certainly isn't doing enough. Um, you said that the government can't subsidise our energy bills forever. Absolutely. Um, and people are facing, you know, I've seen people on social media talking about how their energy bills literally have jumped 250 £300 in one month. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. Price of fuel going up, the price of food going up. Absolutely, Rishi Sunak needs to be putting everything into solving this cost of living crisis because you're going to have more people using food banks not being able to make make ends meet perhaps more people claiming universal credit and all the rest of it so you have to the government has to or rishi sunak certainly has to be focusing on this and looking at ways that actually you you will have to bring in Mm -hmm. some more government measures to make sure that people can keep their heads above water because frankly at at this point people can't christine the government's not doing enough. Um, in fact, the government, I think, is making it worse with its um, national insurance hike, which will hurt ordinary working people more than... Um, it, it will hurt the people who are struggling the most. That It will hit them the hardest, and that's not good enough. Uh, what we need is a way... Well, of, will it, though? Because I think... Oh, yes. I can't remember where I heard this today. It might have been, might have been at PMQs. But um, apparently the, the, the six million people at the lower end of the income scale would not be af- affected mm-hmm. by this and they wouldn't pay it. The average nurse or person working in social care is going to be hardest hit by this national insurance hike. And we're also, the, the fuel bills are going to hit families and the government is, you know, coming up with a loan system. It's going to gamble with our money that the price will come down. Um, and then we'll have to repay it. What we need is something radical, a big change to help people out of this. Like what? We've, well, for example, we've talked about, and Labour have talked about as well, a windfall tax on the companies, that, and there are many of them who've made a lot of money through the pandemic. And now the companies which are making a lot of super profits on um, the increase in gas. Now, those super profits should be taxed so that you know everybody listening to this tonight doesn't pay face a £4,000 hike okay. in their gas bills next year if those companies are, not long term, but for a year, if that windfall tax is taken to pay for what, or, or to help alleviate the burden that ordinary families are going to face okay. so that they don't have to Delicia. choose between paying the energy. Look, and this is something gets. that's happening across Europe. It's not unique to us. And we need to listen to our allies and see what they propose and we see what they propose and what we propose. There are lots of grants that have been put in place in terms of cold homes and uh, there are ways we've taken people out of having to pay. But this is going to get worse and worse and worse. And no one should be suggesting it. So I, I don't believe a windfall tax will be sufficient because we are plunging into the world has changed so significantly. Do you think so what we're doing sufficient? Over the, there's, going, we've, there's no way it could be sufficient because we've just gone to war where energy prices are going to fly so far through the roof that we, yet I don't think politicians have yet grasped how much our world has changed over the last two weeks. No one is ready for this. No one can be doing enough. But I do know there's a special energy unit that is looking specifically how in the world we tackle this. And we all need to tackle this across Europe. Right, we have to leave that one there because we've got a final uh, fun text question from Christine in St Albans. Michael Crick has written a book about Nigel Farage. Who would you most like to write a book about? And Michael, you can tell me who your next <laughs> book is going to be about if you've decided yet. I have. You have. Go on then. Uh, your old boss, Michael Ashcroft. I mean, Michael Lord Ashcroft. He's launching oh, a book yeah. tonight. Now, he, uh, he, he is, goes around yeah. writing biographies of all sorts of politics. David Cameron and Jacob Rees-Mogg, Keir Starmer, and now Carrie Johnson. And yet nobody's written a biography of him. <laughs> and... Uh, He's been a fascinating character. He, uh, you know, there was all that row uh, in William Hague's day about him getting his peerage when he didn't pay tax in this country and so on. I think if you looked into Michael Ashcroft's career, there'd be more than enough fascinating material, not just for a book, but for blockbuster serialisation. Yeah. <laughs> He's led an incredibly boring life. <laughs> <laughs> He'll reward you. I'm now, yeah, I'm now, I'm now just dreading the call from Michael Crick. So I'd like to talk to you about <laughs> <laughs> Afra. Um, I think I would go for Putin or Michelle Obama. Oh, now that's a bit of a contrast. Yeah, I know. I know. Or maybe I'll try and get them in the same book. I'm not sure. <laughs> Christine? Michelle Obama's an interesting one, but I think I would I would have to go for Charles Kennedy because I 
remembered the young Charles Kennedy. I looked up to him even when I was at university and I remember the promise that he had and he has shaped the lives of so many people in this country, so many people in politics have been influenced by by Charles. And I just think that he would be fascinating to write about because his life from was a life in politics, but it wasn't just about the politics, mm. and the politics is really all we know. He's one of those rare people that whenever you met him, you felt good about life. Oh, yeah. He just had that infectious Absolutely. personality, didn't that, he? Absolutely. That's what he was like right back from when he was at university, the way of making people Somebody feel has better. already written a biography of him, though, so ah, you've been beaten to that. Yeah, but Elysium. it's good to do another one. Um, I'd actually write one of my dad. Um, I lost oh. him when I was 18, um, so I lost a lot of his life stories that he hadn't uh, been able to share before then, but he grew up absolute poverty in Ireland, uh, left school at 11, worked as a carpenter, got involved with trade union politics, travelled around Eastern Europe and behind the Iron Wall, um, was a house husband when no one else was, uh, raising me and my brother when my mum was the breadwinner. Uh, really political man, the opposite side of politics to me. <laughs> and I think he had some amazing stories. He'd be and appalled at what you've achieved, wouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Not, but this, I think he raised me in a household where he said, never hate, you can intensely dislike, but he didn't care what your politics was, as long as you could explain it and justify it and that you wanted to help people. And that is why I really struggle with in politics, this obsession people have with mm. not wanting to fight for what they believe in, but hating the opposition. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got no yeah. time for well, it. Well, I'd read it. I have to tell you. I'd read it, definitely. Yeah. Right, well, thank you very much to our panel, Michael Craig, Alicia Cairns, Afra Hagen and Christine Jardine. We'll be back with Cross Question next Monday at 8 o'clock. Now, in the next hour, I want to know if you would offer space in your home to a Ukrainian refugee. Have you thought about it? And if you decided you wouldn't, and OK, if you live in a one-bedroom flat, that's not going to happen, I get that. But if you have space and you've decided you wouldn't, what are the reasons for that? It's three minutes past nine.